We met Wes Maybe at NAMM 2018, and he's been on the show several times since. Wes is rock and roll walking, and you know it at first glance. He lives in London, and when he came into the U.S. last week, customs agents, as they customarily do, asked him his business for coming. He said that he was here to do some work, including some lecturing at a music trade show. The customs agent asked Wes, why you? And Wes humbly replied, well, I'm a published columnist, and I've worked with some renowned artists on some successful projects. Like what? Sting, Taylor Swift, Celine Dion, Roger Waters, Shaka Khan, Robert Plant. The list goes on and on. Chichunk, welcome to the United States. I sat in a session with Wes recently at Laughing Tiger Studios in San Rafael, California, with the artist Tanya Chen, and I was there for the minutia. But seeing Wes work made it apparent why he's in such demand. His patient command of the process, mixed with a great bedside manner and a stimulating wit, made for a beautiful atmosphere for creativity. He's going to be around a long time and continue to make some historic recordings, and we're proud and elated to call him our friend. Here's our special guest, Wes Maybe. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This East. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Cooper. This is Mitchell Epp. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is the Wesonator. Or, let me do this again. This yep. is the Wesonator, as you say it out here. You're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. That's right. All right. We're in a knockoff Chinese restaurant in uh, Anaheim, California, joining us for some uh, really cheap deep fried food is uh, our friend, the great Wes Maybe. He's in the house. Wes, thanks for joining us. No problem. I saw a sign that was, uh, this is going to be one of those shows where we've been, you know, we just want to hang out with Wes, so we're going to just bullshit. We won't. I had the v- uh, very distinct pleasure of sitting in the control with, uh, control room with you last week. At, uh, oh, I hope it was a pleasure. At La- uh, yeah, as at Laughing Tiger Studios in San Rafael, which really is considered one of the great piano rooms in the Bay Area. Yes, yeah, yeah, he's got a very special uh, Yamaha C7. Mm. Which he had completely remodded, and so yeah, it's it's quite a special one. Doesn't mm. really sound like any other C7. So he had that kind of tuned up to the room, and the room tuned up to it. And he's mm. married yeah. a, a beautiful combination. He's married it together, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's wonderful. And we were there with Tanya Chan, who's we positively indeed. delightful. You guys go way back, huh? Uh, a couple of years, yeah. I mean, first time I met her was, was in London uh, when she was doing a, a record with Thurston Moore from Sonic Youth. Mm. Um, and I didn't know what I was in for. I just showed up. I got booked for the session. Uh, Gino Robert was producing. So I knew it was going to be a bit crazy. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so she showed up and, and started... Um, putting things in the piano like Lego blocks and toilet brushes and kitchen scrubbing brushes scouring pads coins ping pong balls then she asked for all my jewelry that went into a bucket and a metal bu- bucket with water in the piano and then Thurston showed up with with that famous Fender Sonic Youth guitar mm. that's all beat up yeah. and stuff and he put that in the piano, plugged it into the amp we have at Rack, that, uh, you know, the, the, the Fender Concert, my favorite, um, the, the, the Jeff Beck amp, we call it. Uh, plugged it into that through a bunch of distortion pedals and proceeded to just make an absolute racket. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it sounds like you know, something that, when all is said and done, sounds like you were killing a pig with a stick. Some parts of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the funny thing was, it was and all did scored. Did they make the chaos work? Yeah, but it was scored. It was it was John Whoa. Cage. It was a John Cage score, and it was it was for for sort of prepared piano and electronic music. Wow, it was nuts. And so, what did the, all of that 
business do to the piano sound because if it's playing scored music you're still looking for a melody and you're looking for no they're not oh I, that's that's what I learned. It's very frowned upon to even approach something called melody. Huh. Yes, so it, it's 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 as far as melodic as they can get. You know, which is interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was really interesting because it it sort of puts you into a frame of mind of you have to play an instrument, but not the way that instrument was intended to play. And I I think that's really cool. Yeah. You know, to find ways of making sound out of something that was not designed to make sound like that. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it, it has helped me further on, because I've, I've done about four, four sessions with Tanya and with Gino and, you know, Tom, Tom Dill and all that stuff. And it's kind of bubbling in the back of my brain. And when I'm working on a project and I suddenly need a weird sound... I can sort of tap into that and go, yeah. right, if, if I just put a metal file under my strings of my guitar and I put an ebo on one note and I put a little vibrating children's toy robot on another string, I'll probably come up with something crazy. Wow. <laughs> so would you say that they kind of walked into a room in your imagination and kicked a hole in the wall? Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah, she's a very interesting artist. She is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is the first time I've I've recorded her actually playing the piano. Wow! Without without the piano being prepared in any kind of way. Well, and I won't say that there was no, um, you know, search for melody or some, something. Well, this this was very very much set that in, in the score, which y- is a completely different. Yeah, that composer. piece though had a very strange melody. Yeah, it was a very unconventional piece melodically speaking it was kind of all over the place and it was very jarring and uh it was and i, I think i think it's it, it was it's just morton feldman toying with your mind because he's messing with the harmonic structure of everything because mm-hmm. you know you play one note but the pedal's down so it just keeps on ringing and ringing and ringing and at the same time you're just moving around that and all these frequencies just start mushing together and time signatures like, yeah oh god every every bar was a different time signature <laughs> it's crazy that was maddening <laughs> yeah how do you take something that's so atypical and produce a body of work based on that I mean is there a marketplace for that do people want to be musically aggravated or whatever it is yeah, I, I think the answer to that is yes huh <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely a market for it, um, although probably a niche market, but sure. but they're pretty hardcore. The fans of that stuff is, is pretty hardcore, um, and I don't know. I mean, I think it's twofold. It, it's like one segment of that market really gets it, really understands what's being done, yeah. the thought process behind it, and I think the other half of the market is just... they they buy it because they want to be cool that's a good reason sure why you not know. why not I don't hate people who buy stuff because they want to be cool especially yeah. buy music because they yeah, want to be cool yeah exactly because a lot of times the coolness comes and then the music follows and the taste follows for sure for sure yeah so did you enjoy your time in San Rafael man you were a half oh, yeah. an hour from my house <laughs> there's Mexican food around you had your first chimichanga I had my first chimichanga oh, oh shit what a thing I yeah. mean yeah who the hell came up with that? Yeah. Someone oh. brilliant. I've got Someone a burrito. Brilliant. Let's put it in a deep fry. Ooh. You know what we ought to do with this. <laughs> Little known fact of the uh, the Pete world, my mother claims to be one of the inventors of the chimichanga. Oh. There she was at the A&W restaurant, and they basically tripped and fell, and oh no, that burrito's gone to fall into the fryer. Good idea. <laughs> so she uh, she claims chimichanga <laughs> invention status. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what kind of chimichanga did you have? Uh, I, had a, I think I had a chicken one yeah. because I had some carnitas tacos. So oh, I wanted good. to change good it up a little bit. Yeah, nice combination. Oh, yeah. So Ooh, and I had I had something else. Do you get into the adventurous oh. Mexican proteins? Like lengua and cabeza and sesos and mm-hmm. Well I, I just love Mexican food. Mm-hmm. I think I think the first time I had Mexican food was when I came to the to San Francisco. Ended up in the mission. Oh yeah, that's the spot. And there you go. Taqueria Cancun. I was talking yes. to you about that. 
and I ordered a burrito and it was it was the size of my arm like huge <laughs> wow and I was like, Ooh, this, that's like this saying is, you know when thing. I lost my virginity I was at a brothel in Istanbul <laughs> that claims to be the largest brothel in the world and when I made my choice for the person who would begin this journey with me I could choose from one of 50 or 60 beautiful women from around the world that's the equivalent of saying I have my first Mexican food in the mission <laughs> that is Taqueria the spot though. Cancun yeah, yeah. It's a great it was spot. delicious it yeah. was delicious and I think from then on I just went crazy about about Mexican food so I, I, I cooked my own Mexican food oh, good. back home yeah. in London yeah yeah. So what what do you get for ingredients in London? Is there a Mexican grocer? There, there are who can a help few Mexican grocers yeah. where I can get some of the the more spices, the more exotic stuff that you can't find. What's exotic? Well, you know, like the moles. Mm -hmm. and, oh yeah. You know, all that's the, going for it. And the, and the, and some of the spices. I can't imagine you've tried to make a mole. I haven't made a mole yet. Okay. No. That's okay. We're not. I'm not being critical or anything. Um, I've I've never tried making a mole. I've made my own chili relleno though. Okay. Yeah. That yeah, was, that's going that for was it. A, that was a job. Yeah. Whew. That takes yeah. a lot of practice. I make my own bolillos. Okay. Really? Yeah. All right. So the thing about a mole is it's got like 25 ingredients in yes. it. Yes. And, and time too. It's got to sit. Yeah. Oh god. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I like stuff like that. And yeah. The more complex the, the recipe, mm -hmm. the more I'm into really? it. Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Okay, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah. You've been all over the place, and you work in the music business. Have you been to Nashville? You know, very ashamed to say, I have not. Okay, because the thing that's it's on the wish list. The thing that's wild in Nashville right now is hot chicken. Okay. Have you heard of this? Nuh uh So this woman, uh, there's a restaurant out there called Prince's, and this woman who who owns the place, she found out that her husband was out skipping around on her mm -hmm. so she made him some chicken and what she decided to do was pack a bunch of cayenne pepper underneath the skin and put a bunch of hot sauce all over the all over the meat mm -hmm. and she uh, fried it up and really was it was an attempt to light his, his face on fire and it turned out that he loved it <laughs> <laughs> so she started offering it at her restaurant just the way she made it for her philandering ass husband. And it turns out Nashville loves it. Okay. And now the rest of the world knows about Nashville hot, hot chicken. Hot chicken, okay. Yeah. That's funny. So, lesson to everybody out there. Yeah. Some good things come out of ch No, I'm not even no. going to say that. <laughs> Since we last chatted, you had just finished up working with UB40. Yes. On their album. What have you done since then, besides uh, the stuff here in Marin? What else have you done? Oh, God. Lots of stuff. I mean, there's been lots of sessions at Rack. So, right. you know, it's a big variety of artists just come through the door. Did some stuff with Andrew Lloyd Webber and Taylor Swift. Got Marty Pello in. We did, we did a whole bunch of songs yeah. with him. Um, How does it work? Like you're sitting at the house, you know, playing Nintendo or whatever, and someone <laughs> calls you, or like, how do you how do you get work? Um, well, a, a, any of the rack bookings are, are he's the Wesinator. <laughs> they 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 just phone calls. You yeah, know, we've got a session coming in, and it could be like a month in advance, or right. it could be, can you be here in the morning? Sure, no problem. So stuff like that, and then you know, you go out and find artists that, that are yeah. cool and fun to play with. Uh, I mean, what, one of the bands I'm working with at the moment is called Hadrian, uh, English band, quite heavy, uh, very cool, interesting voice, heavy guitars, crazy drums, solid bass player, and I just came across the matter at a music competition that mm. I was judging at, and, oh. and, I, and I gave them a quite a high score. And, you know, at the end, we just exchanged business cards, that was it, never heard from them again, and then suddenly got the phone calls like hey we've just recorded an album we want you to mix it wow so I did one trial one trial mix they loved it and now we're going ahead with the whole album that's so, terrific you know that's so when kind you're of how looking at a, a record that's really heavy like that and you and you're beginning the mix where do you start 
<laughs> what's the what's the the foremost thing you want to get right out of all of the all of the tracks there? Uh, well, with, with, with anything heavy, I would say you know the kick, the snare, yeah. and the bass are very important. Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll probably start with those three components. Okay. With a little bit of everything sort of really low in the background. So yeah, just so you I understand sequence. Or, yeah. yeah. Um, but then, you know, one of the tracks might be a ballad, so I'll, I'll or a slower song. Uh, I'll start that from, from the vocal. Yeah. Sometimes. Or I'll start from the bass. Hmm. And sometimes I, I, I might have been working on the drums for like an hour or so, and then. And your ears get I'll tired, and you got to go somewhere. Put everything else. in, and then I'll go, you know what? Let's pull everything down again. Fuck that mix. And go again. Yeah. You know. Okay. Yeah. What does that mean, though? I mean, when you put all that time in, then you realize it's just you're not on the right path. Is that two hours? Is it three hours? How long does that take to get to where you're happy with where it is? Well, it it won't be it won't be wasted. I mean, it's, right. it's more of a balance thing okay. rather than a than an EQ and a compression thing. You know, those sounds will be great. It, it'll be just kind of you know just the vibe you're in. You, you've been so sucked into this one particular thing, and it's it's quite good to just go. Everything down. Let's start again fresh. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, and I might I might change it up then. I might just start with the bass and then build the drums around that. Do you go yeah. take a walk, have yeah. a smoke, let the yeah, ears totally. let the yeah, ears I'll take a rest for a second, go and play with my cat. Yeah, play with the cat. <laughs> and do you do this stuff in front of anybody else, or is this you in the studio by yourself doing? Usually, when I'm working at home in my my little home studio, in the Sonic Cuisine. Um, It'll generally be me, right? Um, but if I can, I'll I'll start the mixes and then I'll get either the whole band or some of the guys over to come and come and vibe off. Cause, yeah, you know, it, it's nice to have human interaction. Yeah. Um, yeah. Does everybody do that like you? No. So you've got. Is, no. Does everybody do a different thing? Then. Probably. Yeah, I mean, everybody. You know, there's people who, who need to have somebody there. There's people mm -hmm. who don't want to see anybody. Right. There's a just, lot of those and people. And just send, send the mixes. And if they're approved, they're approved. Right. Yeah. I so was I learned the craft from my cousin Daryl. He's got a great ear. He's he's got a wonderful. Uh, he's great. He's a, a great EQ guy. Mm -hmm. He's a good mixer. And he would say. You know, and he's very kind. He's a great guy. We love each other. He loves me. But sometimes he would say, "You can sit here if you want to learn how to do this, but I need you to keep your mouth shut." And you know, he didn't. He did not want to be distracted with the input, because a lot okay. of times I would suggest something, and he would say, "I have to explain to you why I did this, and in order to do that, I have to stop what mm -hmm. I'm doing." Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of guys out there who for all the right reasons they just need the room clear and they need yeah. to do their own work and then there are other people who go no yeah I want to hear what you have to say I want to hear what you like about you know it, do you like it warm like that do you want it to be you know yeah. whatever the input of the artist is I don't know maybe it's because I've, I've, I've been teaching this stuff as well I actually like explaining it <laughs> yeah I don't mind that and, and actually for me in that explanation yeah it also gives you time because it's, you know, we do things that we don't think about. Right. You know, I'll reach for an EQ or a compressor and I'll just go bam, bam, bam. And then if somebody asks me, like, what did you just do there? Actually makes me think about what I did and why I did it. And that's interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah, that tacit you know. knowledge. Yeah. Where you just tactically know, I, I'm going to put this right here, but you lose the why. And that can also... I mean, that you get yourself yeah. into a formula that doesn't apply across all things. Exactly, yeah. I mean, mm. there doesn't have to be a why, but right. it, it's kind of cool to backtrack and go, why the hell did I do that? Yeah. Well, that's cool. <laughs> I'll remember that. How often do you discover something new with what you do? I mean, you know so much. You're a master. You're the resonator for crying out fucking loud. <laughs> you, you discover stuff all the time. All the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've just I've just finished an album for a band, and I have to admit I've never used that much compression in my life. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm 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 usually somebody who goes if I could see the needle moving, I'm like, oh, that's too much. <laughs> right. Because you know, most 
compressors, you know, get that kind of squishy sound, and I don't like that. I like the organic balls to the wall, you know, let it happen dynamics. Yeah. I love that. Um, but this band, it was they, yeah, they were insistent on it. And, yeah, it's cool. I had to switch off, but I also learned that I can get away with a lot more than I thought I could get away with. Hmm. So that was cool. Right, <laughs> right. You know, we were... Pete and I yesterday found ourselves with Al Schmidt, the great, the great engineer mm. slash sometimes producer, but more definitely more well known as an engineer and the an engineer of several classic albums. I think he's got something like 160 gold and platinum oh, it's records. Ridiculous. And he was some of the things that he was talking about were fascinating in that they were rooted in the old school methods. Mm-hmm. Like he would say, you know, we used to. We used to not rely on pr- compression because the two things. Number one, it was a thing called manual compression, which was when it's coming in hot, I'm going to pull the fader down. Just ride the fader. Yeah. yeah. And then the other thing was there was a whole lot more mic technique back then. God, yeah. You I mean, he to. would record somebody like Rosemary Clooney, and she just would, she had so much technique around the microphone that they just don't. Uh, you know, I guess singers value that a lot less anymore. They're taught. I don't think. I don't think it it's taught. Less. Yeah. I don't think it's taught. I mean, I've, I've I've sat in with with you know sessions where they bring in the vocal coach or whatever, and it's mm-hmm. like, don't, can't you hear that they're like they're virtually eating this microphone? Yeah. And yeah. It's. They can't. Yeah, it, and they can't. They're not it's identifying. It's just not it. taught. I think. There's something to be said for those old techniques, but you know with with a guy like Al, the studio technology curve mm. is just out of control. <laughs> yeah. And the the greatness that he was able to achieve in, you know, in rooms like Capitol yeah. and, you know, in the era that he did it, nowadays there's just so much happening that, you know, your head will spin uh, if you don't keep up with it. Is that wow. is that your challenge right right now? Do you find yourself well, challenged by I mean, keeping up you know, with technology? We're, we're in Anaheim, so you just have to walk across the road to get your mind blown by about right. how much fucking shit is out there. There's a lot That's of shit out the there. difference you know. from last year to this year. Yeah. It's like, it's and, how, and how do these guys keep coming up with stuff? <laughs> yeah. Do you think they invented everything by now? Jesus, just hit yeah. the record button, and let's, yeah. let's go. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's great that it's thriving and stuff, but it's... It's also, you know, you get all these kids going to the show. It's like, I have to have that mic. I have to have that, you know. They have to have these things, but you really don't. I mean, you, no. people have done it with a lot less. Yeah. I mean, we just had a conversation about the tech awards. And as the awards shows have gone, you know, grown and gotten bigger, and there's more technology brought in, mm. there's not less people. There's more people than ever because mm. there's more things you can do. And But the things that we were talking about weren't related to the actual show necessarily it was right. like the social media part recording yeah. video for all these different channels and all these other things are brought in to replace what the technician might do to create the right miking or whatever like sure. that guy we don't need that guy we got a robot for that but is is the music is music getting better along with that evolution or is is technology creating just new ways to do the same thing oh that's a really scary question that's yeah, a trap <laughs> It's a trap. <laughs> okay, I mean it if, to be a if, trap. If, yeah, you really want me to be me right here. Uh-huh. Right? Okay. I feel like no, there's a it's, box it's being <laughs> held up by a stick and there's a fish in there. And Pete said, You got a fish? Wes, Wes is a fish you got in a fish? there. No. <laughs> if that's a nice piece of steak, I'll go for okay. it. Okay. Um, no. A chimichanga. A yeah, chimichanga. That's right. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think it's getting better because of it. Okay. Uh, I, I, I actually think it's a hurdle. Mm. Um, because you know where where you know if we go back to Al Schmidt, you know in the heyday, musicians were musicians. That's what they had to do. They yeah. were absolute masters of their craft, and they came in and they knocked it out of the park. And it was all from the heart. And it was like wow, yeah, amazing. And your job you know, was all, to capture those, a performance. All those performances, were like yeah. what? That gradually to me seems to have been lost because of because of technology you know yeah. people now come in 
even if they don't know anything about technology, if they play something wrong, they'll go, oh yeah, but you can fix that, right? Mm. You know, we'll go and copy a, a line from somewhere, or we'll quantize it, uh, tune all the vocals, boom, oh, and, and, and when you're done, there's nothing real. Right. Because nobody actually played anything. <laughs> you know? Yeah. They, they did something close, but, right. but not quite. Uh, and then on top of that, everybody's got a laptop now with Ableton or GarageBand or Logic or Pro Tools. And suddenly everybody's a producer. Right. Uh, it's like, uh, no, you might be a programmer. But you're definitely yeah. not a producer. You're, uh, you might have some idea of how to mic something up. Yeah. But, you know, well, we, and, we and were, it, it's just getting in the way. Yeah, we were handed a CD, and it doesn't matter who it was, because there's a million people like this, mm. but he's like, you know, check out my CD. And we listened to a little bit of it. Yep. But the reason why he's not a producer is he makes a sound that sounds like everybody else's sound. And it was very genre-specific, yep. and just, I don't want to say there's no creativity, but it's very hard to dis differentiate his music between With something 100 else. others. Yeah. yeah, well, I, yeah, I mentioned it at the panel this morning, and there was some question about that, and I went off on a tangent <laughs> Yeah. Uh, about how, how, you know, younger or, or new acts feel they have to conform right. to what's hip now and and labels are as much to blame as as, sure. as those guys because they sort of forcing it onto onto the artists they're like yeah you're great but can you can you not sound a little bit more like kylie or right. whatever or beyonce or rihanna and it's like well hang on a minute we've got all those yeah you know they're all great we right. don't need another one right and 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 the whole thing of of trying to make somebody conform within the music is an insane concept because I I thought music was about expression and freedom. <laughs> Isn't that the constant <laughs> challenge though? I mean, it almost it always seems like anything you innovate is going to create a downstream that makes the oh now it's easier to, and so people yeah, would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw a thing. I can't remember what it was. Oh, it was uh, live from Daryl's house. Um, there was an episode with Gavin DeGraw. And in that episode, he was talking about when he moved to New York. Mm -hmm. And he said that he moved to New York at the same time as a bunch of other people. But he knew that he was going to have a different experience because they were moving to New York to get signed. And he was moving to New York to get good. <laughs> right. And so there's always the person who says, and I, I, I'm not even, maybe I'm cutting on it a little bit, but mm. let's say I'm not. And giving everybody the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. maybe they're saying, I'm going to take on a mission to advance this part of the art form, and in doing so, I'm going to shortcut my performance. I'm going to not make myself a craftsman with a musical instrument. I'm going to make myself a person who's capable of playing a bar you can record mm -hmm. so that you can loop it and that makes for a guy who's never going to play a, a beautiful live performance of a, a whole piece that has an emotional mm. uh, movement in the piece yeah yeah, yeah. but yeah. maybe that person writes a, a you know a nice pop tune that we end up like I oh, know without a doubt I mean there's a place for all of that and I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't have loops I yeah mean, Jesus yeah. we've had some killer loops yeah um but but it it's just what pete said it's like you know it just seems to sound everything sounds the same yeah you know and it's 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 that lego lego generation i call them it's like you know they come in with a laptop they've got thousands of sounds uh -huh. and they just go doop, 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 boop, boop. okay that's the one okay let's loop that uh and then copy that for like 64 bars and then go through the same process again for the chorus, same process again for the middle eight, copy and paste, copy and paste, track done. If that's how you make music, that's cool, but those sounds have been used by a, another million of other people. That, that, I think that's where you were going. It's well, like yeah, yeah. everything sort of sounds the same. There's yeah. no, no individuality in it. If, if that guy who played that eight bar loop goes, Okay, now we've got that loop. We're going to make it really cool by doing something. 
then that's his identity or her identity into that. And that's great music to yeah. me. I'll tell you who's doing that with the technology is a guy like D'Angelo. Sure. Where what he's going to do is, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to loop this, but I'm not going to quantize it. And I'm going to play this backbeat so far behind. I'm going to lay way back yeah, to where yeah, it yeah. just makes your eye hurt. Yeah. And he'll do something like that completely on purpose. Mm. And it'll be somewhat, it just, you know, it sounds so interesting. Mm. But he's still using the same toolbox. He's still got the same, you know, he's in Pro Tools like everybody else. It's just he's not pulling from that same bank of sounds. He's yeah. not doing that. Or if he does, he will shape it. He'll shape so it, So yeah. it's no Do something longer different. a carbon copy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Your Lego example is great because you can go out and you can buy the Death Star and put it all together and there's instructions. And no shit, there it is. There's the Death Star. Yeah. But and everybody's I, Death Star will look the same. Exactly, <laughs> right. When I grew up as a kid, like you just wanted more Legos, and then you just... Expanded on it. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. I never got a set of there Legos that was made for a thing. Yeah. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero, co-host of the Break It Down Show and fellow producer here at Lions Rock Productions. And I'm proud to announce our newest show. It's called Justice. Season 1 is going to be a deep dive into some of the cases I personally worked on as a licensed private investigator, and you'll get a unique view into the criminal justice system that may just challenge some of your personal notions about how it should work and open your eyes in ways you never imagined. So keep your ears open for Justice, a brand new podcast coming in January from Lions Rock Productions to iTunes, Stitcher, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Expanded on it. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, I never got a set of Legos was that was made for a thing. Yeah, it was like right. here's just yellows, a box here's of reds. More Legos. Oh, this one's got some doors, you know. Yeah, and you yeah, just yeah. like, I'm gonna put 15 doors in a row, because uh-huh. <laughs> it, it, it didn't make my experience better or worse, whatever. It's all experience, but it was completely my own exactly. learning process, exactly. and, you know. And I had, and my thing never looked like my friend's thing, because we had completely different paths mm. on how to get there, mm. you know. Yeah, I don't want to build a fucking Death Star, you know? <laughs> yeah, out of yellow and purple yeah. and blue. And yeah. My, um, I brought up my cousin Daryl one time. He bought an MPC 3000, and mm. it came in a box with a bunch of shit. And we didn't, we weren't quite sure where the machine came from, but it was well used, well taken care of, mm-hmm. and it just showed signs that this... This came out of, you know, this didn't come out of a bedroom from somebody no, who, no, no. you know, decided to nuke their rap career or whatever. And it came with a ton of, di- you know, it had the three and a half inch discs. Uh, remember those? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The floppy discs. And there were a ton of them. And, you know, we didn't care about those. We weren't buying those. But it came with a big box of them. And one day we were just cleaning out shit. We'd had this machine probably three or four months. And so I started cleaning. You know what? We got to get rid of this box of these fucking floppy disks whenever or at least reformat them so mm. I can use them <laughs> to store sounds that was my intention so I start pulling all the shit out and then there's this one section of a box and I pull it out and I look and it was Bob Clear Mountain's drum sound collection and it was there were handwritten mm-hmm. things and a cli- and like a, a thing that had been folded up on a yeah, yeah, you yeah. know and it was written I mean we were like is this so I pull him in there I go Darren where did you get this thing and yeah I don't know the path of ownership of this machine and he's just looking at it and I go do you realize what this this is, these are Bob Clear Mountain's drum sounds and he was you know I was thrilled and he was like yeah that's great. You can erase those, too. I ain't going to use those. And I thought, yeah, we're not going to use this. You know, we got our own drum sounds to make. But for a moment there, yeah. I was totally going to plagiarize Bob Clear Mountain's drum sounds. I'm sure they were beautiful. Yeah, I know. I bet they were amazing. So I don't know if he still got them. I just texted my cousin Daryl a picture because he's a bass player, and one of his bass heroes is uh, Melvin Davis. We just got to talk with Melvin Davis because he's the bass player on the Tech Awards tonight. Yes, indeed. And he's a bad motherfucker. <laughs> so I just I'm sending people texts to make them jealous. <laughs> no, that's cool. Yeah. Well, while you're doing that, let me ask you another question about what you do. When you 
someone brings you a piece of music, and yeah. I'm assuming it's in some form of other than just on paper, like it's completed in some way. How much, and I also know that you're the gunslinger. That's why people bring you in. <laughs> so how much influence do you have on that final product? Like, is there a percentage? Are you are you 10% of the final package? Or? It depends. Mm -hmm. It really depends. Um, what, just for example, with the, with the, the 10 gauge guys mm -hmm. uh, that we recorded in mono in Wales, everything was tracked live. All Did you say you recorded them in mono? <laughs> it's called Mono Valley. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say. I didn't record in mono, although I always check in mono. Yeah. Um, so all the guys were playing live. So okay. that, that, that's something that I, I wanted to mention earlier about the discussion of the, the, yeah. you know, the ability of playing, you know, which is rare these right. days. Um, and then later on, when, when it came to mixing, there were some bits that, that just needed a little bit of augmentation. Uh, and, and because I was allowed to produce it, uh, they gave me the power to, to add things. Mm. So, you know, they're, they're, I might have doubled the riff or I might have done a, a harmony on a, on a, on a riff. Right. Uh, something like that. Or just gone lower down on, on like, uh, a baritone and chug underneath it just to lift certain sections. So are sections. you actually grabbing an instrument and recording yes. another piece of music yeah. that you're layering in to complement the original? Okay. Yeah. As long as the artist is okay with sure, that. Sure, of course. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that that's just little bits and pieces here. I, I tend to end up doing backing vocals for a lot of people oh, I nice. work with. Yeah. Uh, which is cool. This do is the first time you've divulged that. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, do you have a pretty good falsetto? I, I usually end up doing the high bit. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> I like it. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, but, yeah, I mean, with, with Ray, Rachel Bennett's album, which is now finished, but I still need to master it, um, I did a lot. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of guitar playing to be done, um, a lot of percussion-y bit. Yeah, that, w that was definitely more than 10%. I mean <laughs> the other day I was in the Hollywood Hills with Pete Koch, and we were talking to Bryce Vine. Mm. And Bryce uh, went to Berkeley. You fucking annoy me, Pete. I know, man. It was you awesome. are annoying. And are Bryce you familiar with Bryce Vine? No. He's we're, fucking we're gonna annoying, change that. too. All right. Yeah. He's way annoying. He was saying part of the thing is that there aren't enough musicians. Now, he went to Berkeley, and it just so happens he's built his professional network around people that went to Berkeley. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, whether they're legit. managing or anything else, yep. he wants people that are better than him. Right. Because he's the guy that's got the mic in his hands, and yeah. everything behind him has to be great. God, that guy's fucking annoying. Right, and he's... And he, He's annoyed by, like, yeah, you can't just do this simply. You have to be steeped in the craft to do what he what he's trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And his lyrics are clever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And his songwriting, his chord arrangements and stuff, they're very mm. thoughtful. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, but he's a pop artist. Okay. So he did, just does it with a ton of respect. And he's so goddamn good looking. And he lives in the Hollywood Hills and he drives a 66 Mustang. Oh, my God. This guy is fucking it's annoying. Worse. I swear to God, I want to put him in a chokehold. <laughs> anyway, he's a fucking great guy. Man, he's such a great guy. <laughs> we definitely got to put you together with a nun. I think he's going on a European swing. Oh, you yeah. know why? Because he's also caramel colored. He's okay. like mixed heritage, uh -huh. just black enough. <laughs> Just, oh, man, he's this handsome guy as hell. is handsome as hell. Yeah. I <laughs> bet he really has a... And he probably has confidence issues with the ladies, too. <laughs> Which God. just draws more ladies to him. Damn that guy. <laughs> anyway. But, yeah, I mean, not everybody goes to Berkeley. Not everybody goes to Juilliard and oh, all those sure. kind of places. Mm. So how, how does someone get that going, you know? I mean, Huey Lewis went to clubs when he was way too young to go to clubs, and he mm. learned by watching. Mm. But how does someone do it these days? I mean, if all you hear is, is formulaic trap music or, you know, hip-hop that sure. sounds the same, how do you, where do you go to hone that? Well, I mean, that that's the thing as well, is that there's so many music and, and, and sound engineering and production colleges around. It's like right. they're churning out so many people and there aren't that many jobs <laughs> yeah what's the uh, quality that are you, know. you seeing any of these graduates that are coming out of school uh some of them yeah some of them you know it depends on the school and and it depends on the graduate as right. well i mean I've, as I've, always I've seen some some killer people come out of it and and 
then you know the the flip side is people who think they know everything but actually know jack shit. Yeah, so I was uh, going to ask, like, you can have you know, a certificate, but that doesn't it mean... It doesn't I mean, mean anything. Yeah, you just learned a lesson the other day, you know, like, yeah. sh- and that's lesson five yeah. million in the list, so... Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, mean, yeah, when I came out of college with my piece of paper, it was like, great, I've got my piece of paper. First gig, I fell flat on my face. I was like, holy shit, okay, um, right, let's get up and do it, do it right. Yeah. Because they don't teach you certain things in like, school. Like tenacity. <laughs> Tenacity, <laughs> bedside manner, yeah. all of that. Bedside yeah. manner. Wow. Um, yeah, bedside manner. Tell me about yeah. that. What's what's involved? Because you did a talk kind of on bedside manner last year. Mm. What what is bedside manner in the in the Westernita? I think it's called common sense. Right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, don't be a dick. Don't um, be a dick. Pretty much. Uh, Go ahead and explore this, but I have a follow-up question <laughs> to this one. Well, I, I think it's just it's just finding finding how people vibe, and the, the, that's why it's different every time. Mm-hmm. Every artist is different. Every every human is different. So you just need to get a, a vibe and a feel and, and adapt to that. And you know, there's so, something to be yeah. said for. There's only so many spots in the room. There's only you only put so many butts in a recording mm. studio, and to be quote unquote cool enough to be in that room is mm. part of the skill set like do you bring something that matters and if you if you are a dick or you're whatever then you better be really gifted <laughs> at some other aspect <laughs> of what you do yes, you know that is true but then again there's still no reason to be a dick well yeah, yeah. <laughs> I heard Greg Garcia he's the creator of uh, this is not my follow up question Greg Garcia is the creator of uh, TV shows like uh, My Name is Earl and Raising Hope. Mm-hmm. Really successful creator of TV shows. And he said that he's been in the writer's room. When he first started coming into the writer's room, he would notice there would be like seven or eight people in there. And that consistently there were certain individuals who would do the bulk of the main story writing. And that everybody kind of had a role. And that he's been in a room plenty of times with a guy whose role it was just to keep the levity in the room. And they'd contribute as well. But there were certain people who you knew, like, you know, if we got rid of that guy, we wouldn't miss his writing as much as we would miss what he creates in this room. Yeah, yeah because yeah. He's, a, he's the vibe guy. And th- that sure. guy had a value. Yeah, I know, without a doubt. So to have a shitty bedside manner, it's like... Uh, there are a lot of people who bring a lot of things, and if you don't bring that, and and you aren't a catalyst for good work coming from the rest yeah. of the team, yeah, yeah, it's only a matter of time before you get left behind. Yeah, I mean, there's not that many, you know. That we touched on it again this morning in this panel at, at Nam. As a, an artist is a very fragile organism, you yeah. know, and when they're in the studio, they're 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 naked. Yeah, you know, they're bearing their soul. And there's not many people who would be able to take, you know, how was that vocal take? It was shit, do it again. Yeah. Not the way to go about it. (laughs) I mean, some people want that. But uh, that's very few. I mean, you know, you you need to sort of dance around and stroke the ego a little bit. And There is certainly ego stroking that's necessary when Mm. it comes to letting somebody free to create great art. But there's also something to be said for the guy who doesn't have to say, that was shit, do it again, because he, he, what he understands is that if that artist understood that that thing was shit, he wouldn't have asked. He would have just done it again. Yeah. And then if, they, if, if you heard something that you thought was shitty, that artist heard something else, maybe. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's a difference between saying, that was shit, do it again, versus... You know that was that was really cool, but I know you could do so much better. Yeah, you know, but they, I know it's in there. That didn't capture now the greatness it. that I've seen you belt that yeah. that lyric out. Yeah, with. you're just warming Let's up. Let's get there. Don't worry about it. Have yeah. a sip of tea, whatever. Right now, go and kill it. Yeah, you've actually you taught me that when we did an album fight. You talked about. Led Zeppelin and what Led Zeppelin was capable of in the one we did. And it was yeah. like, oh, you know what? Yeah, because we're always trying to figure out what that line is, where that bar is at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're like, well, that certainly is it. This isn't. <laughs> and it, I don't know where that bar but you can definitely see where one is and one isn't. That's, yeah, yeah. It's an interesting way to evaluate things, you know. It's like, yeah, I've seen your best. 
this isn't there. No. You know? No, right. and, I, and I think that particular album, it was themselves producing themselves yes. in, in, uh-huh. in, in a hut in Wales somewhere. Right. It's like, I mean, you know, yes, you can produce yourselves, but... Not always a great idea. Not, I mean, it, it's that division of labor, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you, 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 should, you should concentrate on playing a shit-hot guitar, man. <laughs> yeah. The uh, same thing happened in know. the Stevie Wonder album. Right, and he could do anything. I'm talking about at Stevie Wonder's level of failure, just <laughs> you know, in the yeah. stratosphere, which is grand but success for everybody else. Right. Yeah, right, yeah. But I mean, there is a level, or is a point where indulgence and self-indulgence meet, and it's like they they get out of agreement, mm. and uh, you probably need you know someone behind the glass to go and just rein you back a little. Yeah, bit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Here's my follow-up question: oh, What yes. is the craziest fucking thing you've seen somebody bring into the studio? You know, somebody has their thing. I just got to come in here with my whatever. And for some people, it's like, well, I, you know, I get a six-pack when I'm on my way there. Or I just, you know, I have this sweater that I like to wear because it reminds me of my mom, and that puts me in an emotional good or place. I've got a sweater for my elk hound. Yeah. Here's, here's Ray, my elk hound. Right. What is the oh craziest, God. like, are you serious? That is, that is a cockatiel. Yes. Yeah. Or, you know. I'm not sure I've ever come across anything that crazy. Uh. Maybe in his world, know. crazy ass shit is normal. Yeah. <laughs> well, That's yeah, maybe. Say. I'll have to give that some thought. All right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The artist Wooby. What's right. that thing right. that allows That's them to? Big. That's what I was going for. Yeah. There's an artist Wooby. Yeah. What you is know, the Wooby is that comfort object. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a security blanket. Yes, Sometimes yeah, it's a teddy yeah. bear. Sometimes it's an eight ball of cocaine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've, yeah. That's my Wooby. I don't, I don't think my Wooby is an eight ball of cocaine. <laughs> I don't think it you was. You see a these prostitutes? They are my wooby. They are collectively <laughs> my wooby. I'll I'll have to have a think about that. It's probably like Pete says. You know, I, I probably never noticed because I think it's normal. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like we saw a dude wearing '70s era roller skates. A bunch yes. of guys in the band on the way over here. You know. Yes, saw they them. Look, look like sneakers with roller skates attached to them. You know, yep. and it's like, all right. Not weird here. Yeah, that's what ma'am. it takes for you to go for it. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's not even close to weird here at this yeah. place. No. No, it's no. Not. no, not at all. <laughs> that's what we love about Nam. Yeah. You know, I'm wearing like regular pants and regular it's shoes. It's a melting pot. And everybody here has like a shtick, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't mean to call it that, but a lot of people here are, you know, an artist of one kind or another or a, you know, there are a lot of people who have jobs that are really very alternative non nine to five jobs and they gather in numbers like a hundred and twenty thousand mm. here this week. Oh well I have to have my hat with my doobie brother feathers. Right. Right. <laughs> do you know do we tell you that we were with Skunk Baxter yesterday? Yes. Yes you did. Man. Yeah. It did. That guy's got brain power that is uncommon. He's, he's put it to fun. work. Yeah, dude. he's put it to work. I, I have one more question for you. Go on. How often do you play Wes's music when you just do what you do? Not for anybody else's reasons, like you just grab whatever instrument you want and you play just what you want to play. How often do you get to do that? I try to do that every day. Okay. Yeah. Um, nice. Because there's, there's a lot of scroll bar time, as I call it. <laughs> ah. Okay. Where I'm waiting for a, a song to bounce out sure. or, or or a project Render to back or up yeah. or something like that. And it's just, you know, the little candy bar going round and round and round. And I always have a guitar in the in the room, so I'll, I'll just pick it up and I might just do scales. Mm-hmm. I'll just noodle a little bit. Or I might just go, you know what, today I really want to learn that song. And I'll I'll just sit down and try and get somewhere in the time that, that yeah. I have. Interesting. Um, but yeah, I just I just try to noodle away every time, every day. Like There's a lot of that time where you sit and you watch the computer 15%, yeah, yeah. 16%. And you're right, you can grab yeah. something, tambourine, whatever it's going to be. And yeah, I mean, it could, it. Be, could be, you know, after work as well, just sitting in front of the TV. Yeah. Just pick up a guitar and sort of play along with the theme songs of the the series you're watching. Sure. You know, it's like, sure. oh, follow this Seinfeld tune. <laughs> Do you have a uh, band together right now? No, uh, I don't. Uh, although there is 
Well, this, this, this will be for the Break It Down show listeners in the UK. <laughs> oh, we got a scoop. <laughs> uh, there's an, there's an open mic night at the Grove Pub in Hammersmith every first Wednesday of the month, mm. <laughs> which is organized by two really cool dudes. Uh, they're both called John. Uh, one John's called John Dunn. He's a killer guitarist. The other John is called Bonzo. He's another killer guitarist. And they just put on this open mic night and anybody can show up I'll as, have to come as out long there. as it's acoustic and, it'll, and we could be you you and the three John, we'll have enough Johns for an <laughs> outhouse convention that's right exactly. we could be Wes and the outhouse convention <laughs> brilliant yeah and you can just show up do a couple of songs yeah. and then at the end because there's like a house band that just kicks things off sure and it's usually pretty Americana led you yeah know, the band stuff like that yeah. Tom Petty yeah. you know a lot of Bowie involved as well all right. And they just kick it off, and then anybody who wants to play just gets up. So uh, the last two, I've actually had the guts to get up and play. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. The now here's why I'm surprised by that, because you are a veteran of the industry, and to say the words, I had the guts to get up, mm. your bar for guts is at a different place. <laughs> I want to encourage our listeners, especially those who are younger uh, listeners who are maybe brand new instrumentalists just yeah. getting into the guitar there's a point at which you're going to realize uh, that you should fear some some situations and if you're not yet at that point god bless you go hit up as many open mics as you can <laughs> because i remember going out and i didn't care who or what or you want to listen to me play i'll i'll play for you all day long and I'll, you know, and, and now I look back and I think, oh, man, those poor people I tortured. <laughs> but it's really just the mindset. So it I'm going to encourage everybody, get it out there, get up on stage. Fuck yeah. it. Yeah. Because that's th- how you get good without even realizing you've th- gotten th- good. Yeah. I think the guts with this one is, is it's, an, it's, it's just me and an acoustic guitar and, and maybe a mic. Yeah. And, and then that's it. Or... You know, I mean, the last time I wasn't even planning on playing, but the two Johns just pulled me out of the crowd and just went, "We're playing Brain Damage by Pink Floyd, and you're playing, and you're doing the BVs." I was like, oh, "Shit!" <laughs> that happened to me uh, recently okay. as well. I was at Luca, and I got pulled up uh, by my friend Ken, who his band's called the Wasted Rangers. Oh, okay. And I love playing with them, and I'll play anything. But he pulled me up, and th- he looked over at the guitar player. Uh, David Finkelstein Mm -hmm. and he said what do you want to play Dave and Dave said let's do this and it was like a halftime shuffle Uh. which for a drummer come on man help me out a little bit don't put me on the spot and have me play a halftime shuffle right out of the gate (laughs) on somebody else's drum I could make up all the circumstances plenty of great drummers can do that that's a fucking hard thing to get up and do right out of the gate Mm. let's start with smoke on the water (laughs) Yeah, yeah 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 warm into it a little bit anyway but you know again to those to those young players yeah um you know get up within a few bars yeah that fear is gone and and you're having fun and now it's now we're thinking about ooh, which which one shall we do next yeah so i'm excited yeah i'm excited i'm actually playing (laughs) that's fun that is is cool yeah so hey man thank you for joining us thank you for uh I get to say I've hung out with you quite a bit this week. You have. You have. That was a lot of fun. We had some studio time together. Yeah. <laughs> we had some studio time to get. Man, I haven't been able to say that in a long time, and it was a beautiful studio. And, man, I really um, I really dug Ari. Ari's oh, great. Oh, yeah. He's cool. Yeah. Yeah. He's got so, good stories. He's got good stories. We're going to get him on the Break It Down show. He doesn't know it yet. Please do. So, Ari and I want to say... I love that we got to meet you last year, and I just love oh, the fact that we get too. to do this on the show and just have all these new friends. And I, I'm absolutely dying to get to London to hang out. You know, cool, come man. on your tour. Yeah, we got to go. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do a break it down London tour. You know what we need to, to do, to. listeners? Help us out. We need to do like a uh, GoFundMe oh, yeah. <laughs> so our <laughs> listeners could yeah. hook us up with some, uh, you know, airline tickets. A little bit of a little Send bit of airline John money. and Pete to yeah. London. Yeah, that's right. That's, that's right. right. So we can go out there and do all kinds of. I'll do the cooking. All right. Oh, perfect. We're in. <laughs> All right, guys. 